Have, have you heard uh, the new study that maybe confirmed what we should have already known that hot dogs are bad for us? <laughs> Did you know that? It's propaganda. See, see what's happening now? So we have a bunch of hot dog lovers, apparently. And the thing is, the thing is, what's interesting about that study, obviously you have to know hot dogs are not good for you. I mean, it doesn't take somebody who's really smart to figure out what we do is when we get a study like that, which by the way, the disturbing part for me was the fact that they've found human DNA in hot dogs now. I mean, that's a little different than I'm used to. And I like hot dogs. So here's what happens. There's actually a direction I'm going with this. So here's what happens. When you hear that information, what you and I start doing is deciding if we're going to believe it or not. And if we're believing it or not, we decide what we're going to do with that information. It sounds like a lot of you here are sort of putting your love for that food item over what may be factual or not. So this is how it is. This is what we do. There's something about us, the way we think, the way we're wired, is that we have to come to places where we make decisions based on either what's best or on what we want. And to be honest with you, I'm probably still going to eat hot dogs, but I'm st still working that about out. But here's the thing. In the Bible, we have something that is presented to us over and over and over again in many different ways, and yet it's so easy to miss. And that is that the world is bad, and in the world we will never, ever, ever find fulfillment and satisfaction. And yet, like some of us, we still somehow, some way, in our minds can think that maybe, maybe, just maybe, the world can give us something. Or maybe there would be a blend, a mixture, where it's God and the world. And maybe I'll have a little less of the world and a little more God. But what we're going to look at this morning is so powerful because I could stand here before you today and say what we're going to look at is how to have a good life. The Bible tells us directly how to have a good life. Think about that. And the question is, or the variable, is how you and I respond to this truth, this teaching. And I wish when I was 16 years old that I would take this to heart. If you're younger here today, you are the most blessed because the Bible tells us how to have a good life. And you know what? It's been right in front of us. It's right in front of us. It's been there all along. And yet, it's so easy to miss. So when we look at this next lesson of grace as we go through the book of First Peter, keep that in mind that wherever we are in life, whatever's going on, whatever has been happening, that today, today would be different. Today would be a turning point. Today would be a day that we listen differently, that we take in differently, that we respond differently. And you may say, well, I have a good life. Life is good. Life is amazing. Well, God bless you. And praise the Lord 
for that and keep it up. But please, let me just ask all of us that we wouldn't stay stuck where we are, but we would be open to the fullness of all that God has for us. Amen? Let's look at the text here today. We're in 1 Peter chapter 3. And the title of the message, is, if you're taking notes, is simply Grace for a Good Life. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. He says, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Interesting. As we look at this, we're going to look at what a good life is. We're going to look at how to have a good life, how it actually works how that looks. And then we're going to see what really the basis of life is. The first point, if you're taking notes, watch this. What is a good life? Now remember, this is in context of a whole thing that Peter's been saying and discussing. And what he's been doing is he's moving us in this discussion from chapter one. He's moving us in this direction where we would, would see God. We would see what he's done for us. We would see our position in him. We would have a perspective where we look at this life as not the end all, but we would see it as a place where we're moving through as sojourners and pilgrims. And overarching this, what's interesting is we see this emphasis, this stress and strain being put on one, the fact of who we are in Christ, which has changed. So our life is completely changed positionally with our position in the world and with other people. There's this dramatic shift that occurs when we give our life to Jesus Christ. And this shift that occurs as we become children of God, it changes our relationship with the world and it eases that natural instinct in our hearts, in our minds to be something because God has already been for us, to do something because God has already done for us to get something because God has already got it for us. What I'm saying is the gospel is God's extension of grace or goodness to us that says we are complete in him now, not future. Now we are complete in him. Now, practically, how does that all work out? That's what he's trying to get us to understand. So, Notice in verse 10. So now he says, after he's talking about suffering and persecution and the realities of life, he says, for he who would love life and see good days. Are you interested yet? That gets my attention. And you know what he's doing? He's quoting from David, Psalm chapter 34. But I want you to notice two things. What is a good life? He mentions two things. One, loving life, and two, good days. Two things. What is a good life? One is loving it. That means not dreading it, hating it, thinking to yourself, I hate my life, I hate this life. I hate what's happening in my life. That's one. 
A good life is one that loves life. And you know, it's okay if you're a Christian to love life. You know, sometimes we think to ourselves, I'm not supposed to love life. I'm supposed to hate it. Doesn't the Bible say that we're to, if we um, love our life in this world, what? We're enemies of God. Enmity with God, yeah. The, the understanding is, and the teaching is, we're not to love our life in this world. And we think or connect that it's godly or spiritual to be miserable in the world. You know what that says or suggests? The Bible's teaching about our relationship or our life in this world is that we're to hate our life in this world when this world is feeding our life for its satisfaction, meaning, joy, and purpose. When we live for something bigger and greater, now we are in a position to love life because we're not attached to it. Instead of life using us, we use it. So we're not vested in it, we're not valuing it, we're not treasuring it above our relationship with God. So what is a good life? A good life is to love life and to see good days, that our days would be good days. So here's, here's, here's a good life, that we would love it and that our days would be good. So you're saying, well, that's not so easy, is it? It's hard to love life, and it's hard to have good days. Here's where this gets incredibly amazing. Here's where you have this seismic shift of spiritual understanding, because this is quoting from David. Do you want to turn, do me a favor, turn to Psalm 34. This is quoting from David who is writing Psalm 34 when he was being chased by Saul. So think about this. David is saying, hey, you want to have a good life? Do you want to love life? Do you want to have good days? Here, here's what he's saying. He's writing this as he's being chased by Saul. Saul is trying to kill him. He's writing this as one who has been unfairly treated. One who has been unjustly treated. One who has been cast off. One who is the, the victim of someone being jealous or envious of him. And now he's, he went from a high place in the palace to no place at all. He's one who knew what it was like to go from a low place to a high place to a low place again. This is something we see in the Bible where Paul says, I've learned to be content whether I have a lot or a little. In all situations, I've learned that. And then he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What is he talking about? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me to be content in any situation and circumstance. Are you at Psalm 34? This is amazing. Because you may be sitting here and your mind is saying life, a good life, a life that I love, will involve things going my way having things. A life of ease and comfort would be a good life. Living in Hawaii would be a good life. <laughs> that would be nice. And I pray that we would, by the power of God, that mindset would be obliterated because when we think that way, we're set up for a disappointing 
unfulfilling life. But here David writes this. Notice, notice in verse 4. We're going to see something here, a thread going through here. Psalm 34, 4. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. Okay, do you see something there? One, you see the presence, not absence, of difficulty. Two, you see God working in that difficulty. Look at verse 6. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Again, what do you see? You see trouble. And you see God working in that trouble. Look at verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Do you see a pattern going here? A good life is not the absence of trouble. That's the hot dog study. It's in front of us. It's there. It's screaming at us. When will we learn? When will we stop trying to run away and start seeing God in the problem? That's not enough for you. Look at verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Look at verse 10. The young lions lack and suffer, or lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Do you see a parallel there? Now we see another issue, another problem, but we also see the Lord working in that problem. Look at verse 17. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Are we starting to get a different idea of what a good life is? Look at verse 18. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. David is quoting from that psalm. Or Peter's quoting from that psalm, psalm of David. Here's what we have to understand. Here's how, what we have to rest in, relax in. Here's where we have to find our peace. Here's what a good life is. A good life is right in front of us, trials, tribulations, difficulties, hardships, hungering, suffering, and it's the Lord who's working in all those things to deliver us. Amen. That's what a good life is. Here's some words that were in that text. I just wrote down some of the words that were in there to give us an idea, an emphasis of a good life. Fears, poor, troubled, lack, hunger, evil, cry, broken heart, contrite spirit, afflictions. Those are conditions of a good life. Let me then say, those conditions for a good life are the conditions for a good life because in those things, the Lord in that psalm, delivered, saved, is near, guards, and redeems. Guys, can we see this once and for all and see what a good life really is? Can we get to the place where we can see troubles and hardship and disasters as something like James says, that I can count these as joy? Not because they're just random things and we're idiotically looking at these things and saying, I'm a glutton for punishment. I'm a sadist. I'm a masochist. I love to be tortured. I love to be hurt. No. Can we see these as opportunities for God to do something in our life that's so much greater than the problem? 
what David's saying, what Peter's saying. Remember, Peter's writing to people who are being burned in Nero's garden as torches, as flames. Peter himself is writing as a man who would be killed for his faith. And he's saying, you want to have a good life? It's not about the absence of problems. It's about the delivery of God working in and through those problems. You may be saying, I'm just tired. I'm battle weary. The struggles mount up and they overwhelm me. They, they burden me. They're just one thing after another. It seems like I can't get any relief and I need a break. I need to let my hair down. I need to let loose. I had to tie one on. Come on, can I have a break? That same David said that after he had been out to battle for a while. And he relaxed when he should have been fighting. He rested when he should have been engaging in battle. And he fell in sin to Bathsheba. Please understand this. Our bodies need rest. That's why we've been given the Sabbath day. That's why the Bible says that we're to take a day to chill out, to relax, to decompress, if you will. But you know what spiritual rest is? Spiritual rest is not spiritual inactivity. Spiritual rest is spiritual activity. It's different than our bodies. If you want to rest spiritually, be spiritually active. In the promised land, that was a, a land that they were to take and conquer. as a land that was a type or a symbol of abundance and supernatural and overflowing and goodness of God. And it was also a type of rest. And the Bible says that in the promised land, there were enemies at every side, but at the same time, there was rest there. Do you know what that means? Here's the, here's the thing. There's a tendency when things get hard to spiritually disconnect, to spiritually deactivate, to think somehow, some way spiritually, we need to stop. And you know what? If we've done that, we've fallen into the devil's hands. That is exactly what he wants us to do. To give up, to shut up, to quit, to stop. And what we need to learn is those very same trials, struggles, and issues that we go through are the way that we have a good life. And how do we have a good life? It's the way that we go through those times and now the significance of God in those times becomes so much more real, so much better, so much more important that now what's happening is we are becoming closer to God, which is better by far. That is the high life. That is the life that is to be envied, that is to be lived that is to be experienced. So summing all that up for a second. I know it's a lot to process. You're probably still stuck on the hot dog thing. <laughs> a good life is a dependent, trusting, experiencing God life. Both intimately and powerfully in and through trials and tribulations. He who would love life, you want to love life, you want to love life. Now we're faced with something. We're dealing with something. Things seem like they're falling apart. Things are going in a different direction. The rug's been taken out from under us. Okay, you want to love your life? See it as an opportunity. See it as a situation that's worked through 
the sovereign hands of an almighty God who loves us, keeps us, and knows what's best for us. And I want to give you three things of how we can love our life even or especially in those times. One, to love life, we have to know that there is a purpose for our life. To love life, to get up every morning and be that annoying person that wakes up and is so happy and is so excited that you say, what's wrong with that person? Let me have my coffee first so before I deal with that person, that, that person. To love, you have to get up every morning and know there's a purpose here. There is something amazing here. There, there is a reason, there is a cause, there, there, there is a way that God has made me, a reason that I exist in the place that I exist, in the time that I exist, and that God loves me so much that he has a very specific, detailed plan for my life that's amazing. There is a purpose for my life. You want to love life? Know that there's a purpose. Number two, you want to love life? Value it. Life is a gift. Life is is precious. Life is valuable. Life is special. Think about God making us handcrafted in our mother's womb, putting together our DNA and our systems of our body that work so intricately, and then to put together our wiring and the way we think and the way we understand and then to have us born into that specific family and that specific place and then throughout our life to be leading us in all these different directions of life we have to see the hand of God on that the purpose and we have to value our life like God values it how much does God value your life so much so that he died for you. He values you and I so much and he saw us as so valuable that he was willing to die to show us how valuable that we are to him. And then the third thing, we have to, if we're going to love life, we have to have a trajectory. What does that mean? We have to have something that we live for, not a random thing. You can pick things that you live for, but only picking the one thing, the right thing, Jesus Christ. When we begin to know and understand who he is and what he has done and the purpose and the value that he has for our life, if you want to love life, live for God. Live for God and make Him your aim, your purpose, and your goal. And then you and I will begin to see life in a whole different way. And if you want to see good days then, okay. Well, I love life because I know I'm made for a purpose and I know how valuable I am and I understand that I'm living for God. So how do I have a good day tomorrow? It's getting really down, down to the rubber meets the road level. You want to have a good day today, tomorrow? You're off to a good start already. Number one, serve God. You want to have a good day? It doesn't matter what's going on around you. You want to have a good day? Serve God. Just serve God. You want to have a good day? The second thing, enjoy God. He is there for the opportunity to know Him. And to know Him is to enjoy Him. Have you taken time to enjoy God? You say, well, I'm busy and I work. Well, enjoy Him at work. Enjoy Him in the things that you do. His presence is everywhere. Enjoy Him, relate to Him, fellowship with Him. And then the third thing, you want to have a good day? Praise 
honor and worship him. When I said those things, did you notice that when, when we go through hard things, that those are some of the things that we stop doing? We stop, stop worshiping, praising him, glorifying him, enjoying him. There's a reason, be, again, because Satan means or is intent on disrupting the goodness of God in our life. And so when we understand God right, then all this commotion can go on around us, but it doesn't have to affect having a good day or loving life because nothing can affect our relationship with God unless we move away from Him. Unless we go away from Him. So you're sitting here and you're saying to yourself, is that it? I can actually love life and have good days? Yes. And they are all found in Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian here today, every day is a good day. If you're a Christian here today, you have every reason to love life. And then you may say, well, how does that, how does that look? How does that... How does that work? Now this is interesting because now he says something that probably most of us wouldn't equate to having a bad life. Notice what he says in the second part of verse 10. He says, Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit and let him turn away from evil and do good and let him seek peace and pursue it. Now that seems odd. So now that we know what a good life is, loving life and having a good day, now he tells us how to do that. And he says something very interesting, you'll notice right off, right off the bat. You know what he's doing? He's talking about our speech, and he's talking about our actions, or what we do, two things. What he's saying is, is how we love life, how we have a good life, it's by not getting into the flesh. It's by not getting into the flesh. John 10.10, 10, it says, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the enemy. That's Satan, right? What is his intention? Steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus, it says, he has come that you may have life and that life you may have more abundantly. Here's the contrast. Life in the flesh, life in a place of selfishness, life in the place of us doing it our own way, or a life that's lived in surrender and submission to God. A life that is lived in the flesh is a life where Satan is trying to pull the Christian into so he can steal God's goodness. He can kill the fruit of the Spirit and destroy all the good that God has in the life of that individual. Now, he can't do that permanently because as Christians, we're sealed and safe in God's arms. He has given us all that pertains to life and godliness. It's our experience of those things. See, somebody can give me a check today and I can hold on to it and never cash it, and I'll never get to experience the benefit of that. See, maybe for some of us, it's time to start cashing the check. Maybe if you're a Christian here and God's check says paid in full, and yet we're still living as if God hasn't paid that price. So here's what he's saying. 
He's saying to have a good life, live that life out in the Spirit. He says, live that life out in the Spirit where the fullness of God is, where the experience of God's love is. And be careful. You're being pulled. There are things trying to pull you into the flesh, trying to pull you into the world. There are people, situations, circumstances, and they're trying to get your attention. They're trying to get you to go a different way. And when that happens, we now are walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. And in the flesh dwells no good thing. What I'm saying is don't go there. And do you, do you see what he's saying? He, he's saying let him refrain his tongue from evil. Let me tell you, don't go there. Don't go there. You may have a lot of reason to say things, to defend yourself, say things to get more credibility for yourself, say things to fight for your way. I'm saying don't do that. Let your tongue refrain from evil. Why? Why is this going to ruin my day and give me a bad life? Because I'm being pulled in the flesh now. When I begin to speak evil, and that could be gossiping about people, it could be slandering people, it could be making fun of people, just saying, saying evil things, or get this, it could be complaining about what God is doing. It could be those attitudes that we get towards God because we don't like where we are and what's happening and we start to talk. It makes us feel better. It's like, sorry, the hot dog thing. It's like throwing up. It's like, get it all out and we feel better. But you know what? If, if we have a disease, if we have a spiritual disease, disease of discontentment with God. It's a heart issue, really, isn't it? It's a heart issue. And let me just say, out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. So when we are tempted to speak ill about somebody else, and if we think, well, I'm doing it in my house, I'm doing it away from people, nobody knows about it, well, God does. When the children of Israel were complaining, they were doing it in their tents. God heard that. We have to understand then, whenever we have an impulse to talk bad, to complain, to speak evil about, we have to close our mouth, but then we have to deal with our heart. Don't forget that. We have to deal with our heart because probably the thing that I have seen over the years that has ruined the most people is the accumulation of bitterness. The building up of bitterness over time. A person doesn't realize what that makes them become. And the worst part about it is usually the people around them do and they don't. It's because they've accumulated bitterness and then you can only handle that so much until it starts to leak out through your mouth. I like what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. It says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearer. And then he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Do you see that? Our verbalizing of our bitterness and fleshly heart grieves the Spirit. A good life is in the Spirit. Do you see why he's saying that? 
Do you see why it's so important? And then he says this. He says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. They have nothing to do with you. And then he says, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgave you. The bottom line, when you're thinking or tempted about saying something, when in doubt, don't spout. When in doubt, don't spout. Look what he says in verse 11. Not only are we to, if we're going to have a good life, we're going to have to protect what we say. The next thing is we're going to have to turn from evil. That, that seems pretty obvious, but again, that goes back to the hot dog study. How many times do we read something like this? And we say, I don't, I'm not experiencing God, or He feels so far away, or... I feel so dead inside or my prayer life is struggling and, and I just, I don't have that same kind of pizzazz I used to have when I was on fire for the Lord. Maybe it's because you need to do this to evil and start walking away. Maybe you've left evil kind of hanging around a little bit. Maybe evil has become your friend. Maybe you've somehow adjusted your Christianity to include a bit of evil too. And we cannot avoid the fact that evil or sin is a killer of a good life. There's no other way to put that. There's no other way to communicate that. It is a fact that transcends all ages. Sin will kill a good life. And then the final thing, and the next part, he says, and do good, seeking peace and pursuing it. So, so here's the thing, you want to have a good life. Well, stop the mouth, and when the mouth is tempted to speak, then surrender the heart, let God work on the heart, turn away from evil, but now start doing good stuff. You want to have a good life? Just do good stuff. I mean, how hard is that? Just go do stuff. Just look for opportunities. Pray for opportunities. Go say hi to somebody and tell them how much they've blessed you. Go buy them a Bible. Go take them to lunch. Go pray for them. Go just do good stuff. You want to have a good life? Do good stuff. That's pretty simple, right? And then I'm going to finish with verse 12. And this kind of puts the whole thing together. Where does a good life come from? We know what it is, and we know what to do. But where does it come from? So he finishes off with verse 12, this little section, quoting from David. He says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You know what's going on here? The essence of a good life and where that comes from, a good life comes from being rightly connected with God. That's what this whole thing is about. He's saying don't let Satan pull you into disconnection or fuzziness or gray areas. You want to have a good life categorically, without hesitation. It's coming from the good source, the only good source, Jesus Christ, and being in a right relationship with him. Amen. And that, my friends, is the opportunity before us today. And as we read the scripture, we can learn that it is only the Christian who can have a good life the way God has intended it. The privilege, the blessing of a Christian is not just 
heaven. But it's a good life now. Why? Because it's a life surrendered to goodness, who is Jesus Christ. The source of all good is the Lord himself who is actively working in us and through us to complete us and to make us fruitful in every good work. You want the simple answer to having good life? Live your life and surrender to Jesus Christ. Let's pray.